All right, so again, happy Sabbath. Uh, as we just prayed, we're going to go right into our our Sabbath school. We have the mic out there because we're going. This is a this is an open forum where comments and questions are encouraged, and so we're going to be just looking into a beautiful topic. I think it's beautiful because it's 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 something that we can we have. I think all of us have experienced, and it's something that uh, it's a, the most beautiful experience, I think, in this life. And can, I just want to ask you, uh, can you guess what I'm talking about? Let's, let's, uh, let's, 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 uh, let's be uh, interactive. Can you guess what I'm talking about? What's that? Yes, I did. Yes, I said that. The, that what is the most beautiful experience that we can have this side of heaven? That's the question. Can you, can you just, I want to use the mic though. So we're going to have a runner. I know uh, we have a young man over here who's going to be running with the mic. Yes. Go ahead. I think. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I think they get out of the bread in the head. Huh? They get out in each Sabbath morning. The gathering, that's a good one. Brother Joel and then, well, Sister Jenny, okay. Sister Jenny wants to go first. Is that okay with that, Brother Joel? Ladies first, is that okay? All right. We have sweet fellowship with the brethren and communion. Sweet fellowship. And communion with God. Communion with God. A anybody else? She took it. Come on. Oh, she took it. Sister, Sister Debbie. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. Huh? <laughs> same thing. Beautiful. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. And that is, that is, on, that is on the top. Top list. I said the top three. Would you say? That would be one of the top three, right? But without this one thing, you can't have that. Listen to what I just said. Without this one thing that I'm about to mention, we won't be able to have that. Can anybody guess what I'm talking about? Sacrifice. Come on, because you haven't guessed it yet. Sacrifice. Huh? Sacrifice. Well, well he, we know he sacrificed himself for everybody in the world, but everybody won't benefit. So, you know, what, what is it? Huh? The Sabbath. The Sabbath? The Sabbath is a good... A good a, a surrender to God. Thank you. I came directly from the elder. <laughs> if the elder didn't get that one right, hey, we would be in trouble. Wouldn't we? <laughs> it's called conversion. Amen? Without conversion, none of this is possible. Right? And what's conversion? When Jesus Christ enters into the heart. Amen? We're going to start off our Sabbath school with Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. I can put it on the screen, but I'm not going to go back and forth, so I hope that you guys can just open up your Bibles. I know everybody has one, because if you have a phone, you have a Bible. And if you don't have a Bible on your phone, there's something wrong, <laughs> right? All right, so Matthew chapter 13, verse 15 says, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart and should be what? Converted. Converted. And I should heal them. Oh, wow. That's a serious quotation, don't you think? That is serious. Now think about that for a minute. Hearts being waxed gross. Now gross is a nasty word, isn't it? I mean, think about it. When, you, when, you, when somebody sees vomit, they say, ooh, that's gross, right? That word is, to, is a word that's used to describe something that's just, you know, gives you this nasty feeling, you know? It says, this people's heart is waxed, gross. Ears dull of hearing. So think about this now. If, 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 if this is describing the unconverted, then the opposite would hold true to the converted. The converted would have ears that are open to hear, eyes that are open to see, right? Now, that word converted, by the way, I don't know if I'm going to be pronouncing this correctly, but it comes from the word apistropho. Apistropho. That's the Greek uh, word there used, and it's what it means is to revert or 
to turn about again, right? To turn around, in other words. Do a 180, not a 360. You don't want to do a 360. Some people get mistaken. They say a 360, right? You know, <laughs> if you do a 360, you're going in the same direction. You understand what I'm saying? It's 180, okay? Let's get the mathematics right, right? The geometry has to be perfect here, right? 180, uh, all right? Half circle, right? Yes. All right. So here we have three main elements that are involved with the conversion process. We see we have the heart, we have the ears, and we have the eyes. The, scripture's quotation, the, this, the scripture quotation tells us the purpose of these three elements. The heart is for understanding. The ears are for hearing. The eyes are for seeing. But this is, this is not just in the physical sense. Matter of fact, it's not even really in the physical sense. It is in the spiritual sense that we're talking about here. We will, we're going to explore this as we continue. So there's another question I want to ask to the class. Is it, so you need to pay attention to this because this is for you guys to answer this, okay? Is it necessary to be converted in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? That's the question. I'm throwing it out. You say yes? Does anybody say no? Absolutely. So everybody's on point. It is absolutely, like Brother Joel just said, it's absolutely necessary to be converted, to enter the kingdom of heaven. The problem is many of us don't understand what conversion really really means. There's a change, right? And you know what the change does? The change makes us selfless individuals that become sweeter and sweeter and sweeter as time goes by. Amen? Sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Less rough, less rough, less harsh. You know? And we don't want to... We don't want to prevent the process. Because sometimes we can prevent the process by saying, ah, this is just who I am. People have to accept me because this is who I am. We don't want to be who we are. Because who we are is gross. It's gross. Think about that. Have you ever thought about that? I am gross. I am gross without Jesus. Amen? And so, I want Jesus. How about you? Amen. I want to be sweet like Jesus. Jesus who was so sweet, wasn't he? My wife always uses that word, sweet. When, you know, when she's talking about uh, being kind and being nice. and Her word is sweet. You know? When we talk about the anticipation of having a son... And we say, he's going to be so sweet. That is our desire. That is our hope. Sweet. We want him to be sweet. And you know, when you eat something, I mean, I don't know about you, but I like it when it's sweet. <laughs> Sister Carol, she's lashing her finger at me like, you better watch it. <laughs> but yeah, you know, God invented sweet, didn't he? When he, he put the Adam and Eve in the garden, and I tell this to my wife all the time because she gets on me because I like sweet. And I don't necessarily eat a lot of junk food, okay? But I like sweet stuff, right? So I, I like a banana. I like dates. I like sweet things. I, you know, sometimes I want a, a vegan ice cream, you know, but I don't eat it every day or anything like that. Not even every week. But the point is, sweet is something God invented. When he gave, uh, when Adam and Eve the garden, and what happened? All oh, the fruit trees. Matter of fact, everything they ate at the beginning was fruit. Vegetables weren't even part of their diet yet. Right? Until they messed up and sinned. So what was God's desire? For everything to be sweet. Amen? Sweet. So God wants you and I to become sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Now look at Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3. Notice here, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is very, very serious. What Jesus is saying here is absolutely serious, brethren, because he's now given us some clues as to what it really means to be sweet or to be converted. What does he say? Except ye be converted and 
become as little children, that means being converted and being as little children is the same. He's like doing a double emphasis here. He's emphasizing the same point in a different way. Notice what he's saying. If you be converted and be as a little children, then ye shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But if you don't become this way, you'll never enter. You see, I was, we were talking about this this morning, me and my wife on the way to here. We were talking about how we are to be preparing here. What are we preparing here? You see, when we go to heaven, we're not going to have our characters change there. Do you guys understand that? Do we believe that? Do we know that? How many of us know that? Yes? We know that, right? When we go to heaven, we're not going to have our characters change there. A lot of pastors teach that, though. You know that. A lot of pastors are teaching these doctrines that, oh, don't worry, you're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Your, 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 your character, everything, you're going to be perfect. You're never going to sin again. But what about now? Does God have the power to keep us from falling and to present us faultless? Absolutely. So here it tells us that we need, we, we do not only need to be converted, but that we need to become as little children. Now, are these two requirements, or do they mean the same thing? We, we, we just pointed that out, right? Are they two different things, maybe? No. Is this quotation speaking about a requirement to revert, revert back to being a little child? Like, uh, isn't that something like what Nicodemus would have said? How do I enter back into my mother's womb? Right? Some people might be thinking that, right? Does this mean i got to go revert back to being a little child? In the physical sense? Look at John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. It says, little children. Notice. Little children, God is speaking. Jesus, he's speaking. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, so, so now I say to you, in other words, I'm repeating that to you. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my you know what he also should be putting there? My little children. Are you with me? My converted. My little children. My disciples. If you have love one to another. What did he, how did he address them? Christ addressed his disciples as little children in this passage. But were they little children? Physically? Were they? Some of them might have been older than him when he was speaking these words to them. You know, Jesus was a young man. He never became old. You know that. He was 33. He started when he was 30, ministering, right? So he knew that when he was about 30. Some of them could have been older than him. But he's addressing them as what? Little children. Huh. So what does this mean? It has to do with trust. Are you with me? Trust. Yes, Brother Joel. happy that you bring the, bringing this up this morning, because <clears throat> it's something that I'm going through right now myself. As you mentioned about uh, you on your way here, you were speaking, speaking with your wife about your child and to how to bring him up sweet. My son, I baby, we're going to be leaving in a few days. He's going to Tennessee. I got to take him to Tennessee. And the things that I know and the things that is going on. <clears throat> You know, there's all kinds of things that are running through my mind. <clears throat> and this morning, so a wave of things came down on me that I had to this question that I keep asking myself, what now? And I find I've been asking it much frequently. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? And I find this is bringing peace to my mind. So instead of worrying what they're going to do, what's going to happen, and where everything else, I'm asking him. And then I ask for another thing. I say, you remember one of those mighty angels that you have in reserve? I excel in Israel. Send one up there on the camp. Look over the campground first. So by the time he gets there, it'll be well secure. Amen. I'm learning to be Amen. the other side. Amen. Trusting. 
That's what it means to trust. Yes, sir. Happy Sabbath again. Happy Sabbath. You know, <laughs> today is Sabbath. <laughs> Pray that day. And Thursday, I have a similar kind of temptation with someone. And I brought up this and I said, what did I ever say? And if we come under the, under the child, under the child, children, we cannot enter. Do you really understand what it's really mean? <clears throat> and she said, no. I said, think about this now. You're crossing the street. You and your little two or three, the three-year-old baby. And for some reason, you have to rush across the street and leave she over there, or he. And a car is coming from both sides, and you're over there. And you say, come. The car is coming. And you tell the baby to come. Do you tell the child to look at the car? She said, no. So who does the child to look at? She said, her. Is she going to come? Yes. That child went to the danger. But mommy or daddy said, come. That child is going to run out in the street. Whether the car is coming, bird speed or not, that child does not even look left or right. Mommy Amen. say, come. Yes. Daddy say, come. Yes. This is what. Yes. As if you're a little child. Amen. Which we can attend. Amen. Because our mind will be focusing here, there, and everywhere. And that and who we supposed to be right. Yeah. Praise God. Very good. We understand that the example. Uh, hopefully that never happens because child services might be on their way. But anyway, we, we, get, we get the point. Yes, yes. We don't want to leave our children in the middle of the street while we're walking ahead of them, right? But, <laughs> but we get it. Yes. The child will listen to the parent, and when there's danger, they won't be even aware of what's going on. They will just listen to the parent because they trust the parent. Yes, absolutely. And so is us. If we do not keep our eyes, our mind fixed, then we won't be danger, but we will fall right in it because we are not. Exactly. Amen. You know that when Jesus was speaking to these, his disciples, some of them, or if not all of them, weren't even fully converted uh, at that time. But yet we see that Christ in his wonderful sweetness. I want you to notice the sweetness of Christ. They weren't even really there yet, where they need to be. But he looked at them as if they were. And he addressed them in the fashion of the converted. When he said, little children. So it is that Christ was addressing them as how he saw them, and we saw that it wasn't how they really were. You understand what I'm saying? He sees what they will be and not necessarily what they are at that time. But the question is, did the disciples really trust Christ all the way at that time? No, they didn't. If you read on in the very same chapter, you will notice that Peter went on to deny Christ three times. Therefore, we would have to assert that Christ was seeing them for what they would be as opposed to what they actually were at the time that he addressed them in that passage as little children. That's the beauty about God, you know. I was reading the other day also uh, about, uh, I think it was uh, Jeremiah. He says, before you were in the womb, I knew you and I ordained you. Huh? Huh? I ordained you a prophet before you were born. What an awesome God. Wow. Wow. One thing we can be sure of, and that is that to be as a little child means to fully trust in God. Just as a little child expresses implicit trust in their parents. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, I'll wait for you to get there because I hear some pages. Luke 22, just let me know when you're there. Just say amen. Amen. I heard one amen. You're there? Okay. Luke chapter 22, 31 and 32 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. 
And when thou art converted, notice, strengthen thy brethren. Did Christ just reveal something? <laughs> he just revealed that even though Peter was walking with him, he wasn't converted. But yet he called them a little child, my little children. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. And then he says, when you are converted, strengthen thy brethren. Amen. And Peter responded, you know, look at, look at the verse 33, the next verse. He responded, he said, he said unto him, Lord, but I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And then, he didn't know himself, did he? he did. Sometimes we think we know ourselves, huh? Isn't that true? Sometimes we think we know, oh, we're going to stand, we're going to be able to do this. We're gonna, we put a lot of confidence in self, don't we? And then we realized that we had no strength at all. <laughs> we had messed up. What was Peter saying? He was saying, Lord, you're mistaken. I am converted. I follow you. I go to the synagogue. I pray. I feed the hungry. Peter was self-assured. He had pride in his heart. He, he thought he knew better than God. Didn't he? That's what he was saying. He said, Lord, you don't know me. What are you talking about? Instead of hearing what the Lord was saying, he only heard the voice of the enemy, actually, which was self. Jesus even warned him that Satan was near to him. But he quickly disregarded that. Sister, uh, Sister um, Debbie. Thank God. Praise God for his, his word. Um, you know, as you read... This the scripture, Luke 22, 31 and 32. Um, I'm reminded of his long suffering, his long suffering towards us. And, you know, I can relate this to my experience and my anxiousness to get over whatever I'm going through. Because, like I said before, there is a fall and a rise. You know, it's like this minute you'll feel that, okay, it's better, or you get it's better, and then something will hit you further. But you're reminded that he is long-suffering, and he will bring you through. And I like our 32 that says, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and thus that when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Because, um... I've said this so many times in the last month that I believe that my situation is for ministry. But um, it is, well, I'll say this, I'm not there yet. Because if I'm not over, if I'm not at that point, then how can I strengthen my brethren? But I pray and I thank God for the word that he's still working on me and he's long suffering. And he knows my heart. He knows my heart. So my prayer is just to create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew that right spirit within me. At the end of the day, I'll be able to strengthen my brother. Amen. So Amen. Amen. And that applies to all of us. And let me tell you something. That prayer that he was praying there, he says, he tells Peter, I have prayed for thee. You think about that. God is not a respective person. If he was praying for him, he's praying for me. He's praying for you. Yeah, that's why we... Yes, Sister Yvonne. He's pray, that applies to us. So when you read that, read that with your name in there. He's saying, I have prayed for you, Debbie. I pray for you, Joel, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Amen? Yes, he prays for me that way. Go ahead. I was going to say, um, to Sister Debbie, don't trying to wait for, like, I don't know, a point where you're going to be like, okay, I'm converted. You go forward as if you're converted. Because Christ has prayed for us. John 17, Christ has prayed for us already. So, we should just go forward, like, believe that you are, and just just do. Brother Joel. The key in this verse is, and like I always say, I love this verse, these words. But I have prayed past this. And we, as we study John, how many times we see him or see him praying for us? 
right down to John 17. Yeah. Who when he pleads with the Father, pray not Amen. to Jesus, but for him. Amen. So we accept that prayer. It's for me. Yes. It's for you. So we can walk by that. Amen. Sister Debbie, I, I would agree with what Sister Yvonne just said. Get up and move forward. Each step that we make, make us strong. Each word that we give, give us more. If you hold it in, nothing can come in. Nothing can go out. But the minute you open your hand, what um, Ecclesiastic 11 wants to pass your breath upon the water. We just say that last week, right? Yeah? Let's do it. Amen. The unconverted heart is like that. It thinks it's all good and everything, and it doesn't realize its condition. We want to be humble. We also want to have humility of heart, right? Recognizing our need. Right? We need Christ every moment. And that is something that will keep us running to Him, running after Him, you know? And uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says this. And talking about the, the one that is not only unconverted, but is not even, has not even tasted and seen Christ yet. Notice what it says. Because the, it says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. When we say law of God, we mean the sweetness, the sweet principles of His kingdom. Right? Because the Ten Commandments really embody love principles. Right? Love for man and love for God. Right? It means the sweetness of God in reality. But the carnal mind is not... In other words, it's disabled. So see, Peter, he wasn't converted. But he didn't realize this right here. This is what we need to realize. We need to realize that the mind that we have inherited from birth is not a good mind. This is why we need to become partakers of the divine nature of Christ and receive the mind of Christ, the sweet mind. Our mind is selfish, self-centered. It doesn't even recognize its filthy, its grossness. Doesn't, really, doesn't recognize its grossness. Doesn't recognize its it's uh, it, it's disability. It's really it's a disabled mind because it cannot. It's not subject to the principles of heaven. It cannot really function from a motive of selflessness, in the sense that it's the selflessness of God. The carnal mind can hear in the physical sense. Peter heard what Jesus said physically, right, audibly. But he couldn't hear what Christ was saying to his heart in the spiritual sense. And I'm sure that he even had the best intentions. What did you say? Peter had probably some really good intentions, right? Right? But you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You ever heard that one before? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions is not good enough, right? But the unconverted heart is disabled. It doesn't have the ability. Remember, we were talking about Adam and Eve this morning. How they sewed on fig leaves. Trying to cover up their unrighteousness with fig leaves. You know, trying to, with their own works or with their own, you know, trying to just think they're, they're good enough or whatever. But the good news is that eventually, Peter chose to be converted. He learned that he had to let go he had to recognize himself. Remember when he when he denied Christ three times. That's when he started to see who he really was. He didn't know himself before, but then at that time he started to know himself. And when we get to know ourselves in reality, we know we need a savior. We need somebody to change us from gross individuals to sweet individuals. Amen? It's good news. Sister Carol. Um, just a thought just rolling in my head meanwhile we talk it. Um, back to the original sin. Just to think of how 
the original sin, pride, developed, developed right before God. Um, when I say before God, in heaven, mm -hmm. pride. And to know that because of pride, that's where sin originated. And we inherit that prideful condition. And Satan actually was dismissed from heaven because he couldn't overcome that. That pride he couldn't let go of. And here it is now, humanity inherits that pride. So in order for us to really be selfless, <laughs> we are for ourselves, definitely. We can't do it. No. We cannot do it. But I will be possible, right? So therefore, we have to really learn and understand the origination of it and how cruel it is and how it can destroy us here on earth and can pluck us from not even entering that eternal rest. When we truly understand it, we have to allow that divine aid, as you say, to teach us or help us to learn about it so we can really let go of it and we can do it ourselves only through divine aid because the origin of it is deep. Amen. Uh, before uh, Brother Alvin speaks, I just want to mention another thing that me and my wife were talking about on the way here. When you think about, because you just mentioned Satan and how sin originated in heaven. Think for a minute. Satan was able to deceive one third of holy, righteous, perfect beings. One third doesn't seem like a lot compared to the other two thirds, because God remained. The, the, the majority remained with God in heaven, in heaven, but not on earth. On earth, he has had much more victory than in heaven, because he has had not only two thirds of earth's inhabitants on his side, but probably ninety. I've, who knows? We don't know exactly what percentage, but it's got to be up there in the 90s. 90-something probably. I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing a number out there. I don't know, right? I'm just guessing. But if the majority of earthlings belong to Satan and will be lost, it's got to be in the 90s, somewhere in the 90s that he's gained. That's why he's called the God of this earth. Because he's got the majority of the world in deception. So he's been very successful. His campaign has been very successful on planet Earth. This has been his greatest, most victorious uh, uh, endeavor, you know, campaign. campaign here on Earth. So he got one third up there, but here he's got like 90, maybe something percent of the population, yes. And, and you could also um, look at the example of when Noah was on earth right. and he preached. I mean, it was only eight. Many, yes, that's what I mean. All throughout history, we see he's got like, and it could be like 98%. Who knows? We don't know how many. You know what I mean? It's really up there. And, you know, I, I point this out for a reason. Not just to make a, a statistic or whatever. It is for us to recognize how serious conversion is. Conversion is something that is very rare. It is something that uh, is something that we can all have, right? He's he's offered salvation to every man, every woman, every child on planet Earth. Everybody can have it, but we have to get to the point where we recognize, like Peter, our grossness. That's number. That's one of the one of the elements necessary, or one of the components necessary for conversion. We have to first recognize. Our grossness. In a humble heart, we have to realize, man, I am gross without God. I am dead in trespasses and sins, and I need a Savior. And the next thing we need to see is the beauty and the sweetness of God. You see, those two elements is what brings us to conversion. We recognize how gross we are, and how sweet He is, and the contrast between the two. 
And we realize, wow. And then we hear his voice saying, I want to make you sweet. I want to give you eternal life. I want, and, and in our gross condition, imagine when Adam heard the voice of God. He didn't know who he, he didn't know God. He was like running, trying to hide. And, but when the Lord said, I'm just here to, to you know, give you the, the, the gospel. That's what he did. What did he give them? The gospel. And guess what? Imagine the, the emotions that went through Adam and Eve's heart when they encountered this absolute sweetness of God for them. They deserve to go down and to be left and to, be, to die, right? They deserve to, to go into eternal damnation. And God says, no, guess what? I'm going to die for you. What? After what we just did? Yes. Because that's who I am. I, I just, I, I love you. And I want you to recognize it. Wow. Brother Alvin. That's the love again. That's the love. <laughs> yeah. I'm just here smiling. You know, I'm just going to pick your camera, Sister Carol, and what you said. But that's not something this year because you talk about the sweetness. In the presence of God, where no sin is, sin begins there. And the kind of his sweetness, he allows it to take place until he could not, Lucifer could not stay there no more. His conscience was too much to heaven. They had to leave where he can't see. He cannot be in the presence no more. You mentioned about what protect in the night. You know, when, when my daughter was about 12, 12 13 years old, we had a conversation. I said, I said, I said, strings, about what percent of the world you think will be saved? She said, one. Hmm. She was 12 years old. So, one percent. Wow. And, 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 and so, imagine in heaven where it began and he come down and captivate. He talked about the 98 to 99 percent of earth, and he's still trying, which he cannot get the victory over the last, the rem. He cannot captivate the remnant mm -hmm. because the sweetness, where sin is, grace much more about. Amen. I praise God. Amen. Praise God. He says, if there was just one soul remaining with some openness in their heart. For God, He would still do it. I mean, you know, and it bring, what comes to my mind is that God left the ninety and nine to go search for that one. That's the love of God. That's the sweetness of God. And by the way, I just want to make one correction to what you said. In heaven, right? It's not that He necessarily. I don't like to use that word allowed because it seems like He had something to do with it, right? He allowed sin to develop in heaven. In reality, because He's love, He could not prevent. Sin exactly, to develop in exactly, exactly. So when we use that word prevent, he could not prevent. It shows that he really, because of his love, he gave absolute freedom to, to, to his creatures. Yes. And he could not prevent them from choosing their own way. Exactly. You know, but when we say allow, sometimes when we use allow, people can get, you know what I mean? So I just wanted to, you know, emphasize that. So let's continue. We're going to read something here from Review and Herald. And by the way, welcome. Happy Sabbath. Review and Herald, February 26, 1895, paragraph 7. And what we're looking at is the topic conversion. Conversion. Beautiful thing. So, Review and Herald, February 26, 1895, paragraph 7. And we're talking, we're looking at Peter. We're looking at the experience of Peter because Peter thought he was converted or thought he was all good and he was powerful, he could do all things. But he realized pretty quickly that he couldn't and he needed to be converted. But notice it says here in Review and Herald, February 26, 1895, paragraph 7, after his conversion, Peter showed that he was an entirely changed man. He was not the self-confident, boasting Peter that he had been before his conversion. And when the enemies of Christ threatened him and charged him, that he should not teach anymore in the name of Jesus and bring this man's blood upon them. Their threatening did not intimidate the servant of Christ. Before he was intimidated, but now he had no fear. Notice that prior to conversion, there's fear. After conversion, there's no fear. Do we see that? 
That's beautiful, isn't it? And you know, there's, there's scripture that says, you know, that God is trying to save us, all of us that were all times, all our lives subject to fear. You ever read that before? That God is trying to save us from fear. Fear does, fear is what makes us behave bad many times. Fear is what makes us, you know, there's a, what do they call it? The fight, flight, uh, or freeze, <laughs> right? There's a third one, right? There's freeze. You ever heard of that one? Normally we just talk about fight or flight, but there's another one. It's called freeze. Okay, you either fight, flight, or you're going to freeze, right? If, if you have fear, right? But if you have no fear, you're going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like Daniel, like John. You're going to be, you know what I'm saying? You're going to be like Peter after conversion, of course. So here we see he was no longer intimidated. He did not cower. But with the other apostles, he proclaimed the name of Christ until they were all shut up in prison. Now, you have a comment? Yes, go ahead. Wait, the 18th, 18th one? February. Review and Herald, yeah. February 28th, I mean 26th, 1895, paragraph 7. Okay. Yeah, February 26th, 1895, paragraph 7. Now, many debate whether the, uh, the following scripture, which we're going to read now, describes the converted or unconverted heart. And we've gone over this before, but Romans chapter 7, verse 15 says, For that which, this was Paul speaking, by the way, he says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. And Romans 7, 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying that I found myself in a condition where I knew what was right and what I should be doing, but not being able to do that which I knew was right to do. But the things that I knew that were wrong, and those are things that I knew that I hated, but I, I, I found that I was, I was drawn to do those things. Right? That's the great controversy. That's, that's, the, that's the thing that happens right before we, we start to realize our condition. This is what happens when we are realizing our condition. Same thing with Peter. When he thought he can do right, he found that he did wrong. Isn't that the condition that Peter was in? Right? Thing that he hated. He would have hated the thought that he would be a coward. You know, these fishermen, these fishermen over here, they think they're tough, right? <laughs> I don't know any fishermen in this building, only maybe one here somewhere, but, you know, they think they're tough, you know, they're gangster, right? Right? And they have these, these uh, you ever heard they cuss like a sailor? That, you ever heard that expression? Somebody cussing like a sailor? <laughs> Right? So these are ruffians. These are these are brute men, you know, these are these are these the man's man, you know? I heard a guy tell me one day, he's I'm a, I'm a man's man. I said, okay. <laughs> you get me? So these people, this was Peter. And he could not imagine himself being a coward. And I'm sure that he probably was not a coward to some of his buddies. Right? He wouldn't let them disrespect him. Oh, get out of here. Psh. You know what I'm saying? They probably get them, go get the line over there, go do this. Right? But he did not expect that when he was surrounded by a mob, because that's what it was, there was a mob there. He found himself in the middle of a mob of those who would have been ready to flay him like a fish. And that is when he realized that which he thought he could do, he did the opposite. He thought he could be able to stand for the Lord in the midst of any situation, but he found that he had no power to do it. He was in the same condition that we see here in Romans 7, 15 and 19. Brother, the album. Fisherman. Peter. See, I just, I just exposed you. Well, go ahead. <laughs> Peter was like a, like a crumbs in the hands list among the mob. Yeah. You see, when he was on a one-on-one, -on -one, he was good. He, yeah. he felt tough. Yes. Even two. Yeah, maybe two. Maybe three. Maybe, but not a mob. No. No. See, there he, he knew. He recognized. He needed outside power. 
And that's the, that's the thing with self, see? Self can be tough and rough and think it's bad and think it's, but when you really feel that, when you're in a position where you know you have no way out, now you need somebody to throw you a lifeline. And the only one that's going to throw us a lifeline is Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul had a similar experience as Peter, as all of us had. All of us have, have been in that situation. I've been Right before we've been converted, right before we received Jesus Christ, we were in that position where we thought we were good, we thought we were cool, we thought we were bad. Right? We thought we had everything under control. Paul had that same experience. What did he say before? He said, oh, as a Pharisee, I was, I, I, as touching the law, I was blameless. Right? He was the man. You know, I'm the Pharisee. Uh, you can't touch me. He thought that same way. He thought that he was converted even when he was a Pharisee, but he didn't realize he wasn't. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, the Bible says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. This is what Paul is saying. If, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. He's describing the time he was in that condition. You hear him? Hear, hear Paul speaking. If any man think that he had whereof he can trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness, which is in the, in the law, blameless. This is what he thought of himself before becoming converted. You know? Again, what do we see here? We see what? We see pride, don't we? We see arrogance. Wouldn't that man, before conversion, wouldn't that be considered arrogant? Self-aggrandizement, we see that. Self-confidence, self-righteousness. And all while claiming to be a Hebrew of the Hebrews and going to the synagogue every Sabbath as touching the law, blameless. Did Paul eventually see and hear and get to know Jesus Christ in a spiritual manner? You want to read that for us, brother? Because I, I, I see that you're, you want to read the next verse. Let's give it to Brother Joel. Let him read that next verse because it, it, it's, it's going to be very telling. Go ahead, Brother Joel. Speak it loud and clear. Proclaim it from the mountaintop. But what things were gained to me? Louder, louder, come on. Those I count lost for Christ. Amen. So he came to that point. It was the crossroad which every man must come to in this life. The crossroad. When we realize we are gross, but God is sweet. Amen? And the contrast between the two shows us that we need to be rescued. Acts of the Apostles, page 452, paragraph 1, says, Paul declared that in his unconverted state, he had known Christ not by personal acquaintance, but merely by the conception which he, in common with others, cherished concerning the character and work of the Messiah to come. He had rejected Jesus of Nazareth as an imposter because he did not fulfill this conception. But now Paul's views of Christ and his mission were far more spiritual and exalted, for he had been converted. The apostle asserted that he did not present to them Christ after the flesh. Herod had seen Christ in the days of his humanity. Annas had seen him. Pilate and the priests and rulers had seen him. The Roman soldiers had seen him. But they had not seen him with the eye of faith. They saw him what? Only with the physical eye. They had not seen him as the glorified Redeemer. To apprehend Christ by faith, to have a spiritual knowledge of him, was more to be desired than a personal acquaintance with him as he appeared on the earth. The communion with Christ with Paul, now enjoyed, was more intimate, more enduring, than a mere earthly and human companionship. Imagine, 
Imagine how close Paul and how close you and I can be to Christ, even not having seen him physically. Amen? Read it again. Let's read it one more time. I'm going to start where it says all of these people who saw them. So the apostles asserted that he did not present to them Christ after the flesh. Notice here, Herod has seen, it, has seen Christ in the days of his humanity. Annas had seen him. Pilate and the priests and rulers had seen him. The Roman soldiers had seen him physically, but they had not seen him with the eye of faith. They had not seen him as the glorified Redeemer. And that's something crit critical for us. We need to see Christ for who he really is, brethren. To apprehend Christ by faith, to have a spiritual knowledge of him, was more to be desired to Paul than a personal acquaintance with him as he appeared on the earth. The communion with Christ with Paul now enjoyed was more intimate, more enduring than a mere earthly and human companionship. Praise the Lord. To know him is to love him. What happens to a person when they become converted? Their view of Christ becomes far more spiritual and exalted. They gain the capacity to see in a spiritual sense. When they were once blind in spiritual things, now they can see. And when once and when one receives the ability to see, there is an amazing transformation that takes place. There is a change in their experience. Notice that this text stated that Herod had seen Christ. Annas had seen Christ. Pilate, the priests, the rulers, the Roman soldiers, all of these had seen Christ. But it was not in a spiritual sense that they had seen Christ. It was only with their physical eyes. This is why it says they have eyes but cannot see. They have ears but they cannot hear. In John 12 and verse 40, the Bible says, and we know what, how, in the context of which this speaks, because God, let me just qualify this statement before I read it. God never does anything other than good. John 1, uh, what is it, James, James 1, 17. Every good and every perfect gift comes from God, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, there's nothing else he can give us. The only thing God gives humanity and his creatures is good and perfect gifts, right? But notice here in John 12, 40. So if, if the Bible here says, he has blinded their eyes, because that's what it says. Let's read it, and then I will, will, will expound a little bit. It says, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I should heal them. So someone would probably say, well, how can we fight the will of God? If the Bible says here, He blinds some people, He hardens some people's hearts, that they can't see, they, can't, they won't be able to understand, they can't be converted, because God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Some people will take this as a literal statement without understanding what the spiritual implications are, are really are. The Bible also talks about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. But then if you read on and you continue to look line upon line and precept upon precept, you will see that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Whenever the Bible speaks like this, it's speaking in a idiom. Hebrew is called the Hebrew idiom of permission. Taking active verbs and describing the subject as doing that which he only simply permits or cannot prevent. That is the idiom of permission. That's how the Hebrews wrote the Bible. So God doesn't blind anyone's eyes. He doesn't harden anyone's hearts. But he can't prevent someone from hardening their own heart or blinding their own eyes. And because God created all things, it is written as if he did it. You understand? It's not that he does this. Because if he did this, then he would be a he would be a God that can't really be trusted or loved. Right? Because he would be doing plain games with humanity. But God doesn't do that. He says, it is not his will for one soul to be lost, but that all should come to repentance. 
His desire for all to be saved in His kingdom. He died for all man's sins. So we have to take the Bible and take it line upon line, precept upon precept, and take everything so that we can understand scriptures correctly, like this one, which seems pretty complicated for some people. So God gave all of those men freedom, by the way. And if He gives you freedom, He's not gonna, He cannot arbitrarily harden your heart. Because then he would be going against your freedom. Let's say, I don't want my heart hardened, Lord, but Lord, I have chosen you to be hardened. What kind of God is that, right? We might as well serve the chair. Or, you know, the chair is nicer because it doesn't say nothing. The chair can't harden my heart. So, hey, you get what I'm saying? A God like that would be kind of uh, psychopathic, wouldn't you think? Sister Ivan. But that's not how God is. And how do we know that? Because we saw Jesus. And Jesus didn't go around hardening anybody's heart. He went around trying to soften every man's heart. Because he is love. And he came to represent the character of God. Sister Yvonne. Um, I was going to say the um, verse 37 kind of explain why the, the heart was um, blinded. But he says, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. So if you read the first, you know, exactly. I remember if I can explain something like he said. He says, when you read the scripture, read the one before it and the one after it, it, it kind of like explain Amen. Amen. what this is saying. So because they did not believe on him, then then when it continues, you see the result of not believing on him. That's why their heart were blinded and their hearts were hardened. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I mean. Line upon line, precept upon precept. You'll see it. So notice here, God gave all of these men freedom, didn't he? Doesn't he give every man freedom? Didn't he? Give... Matter of fact, the fact that Lucifer or Satan now, we don't want to use the word Lucifer because that. Doesn't ex that doesn't describe him. Satan. The fact that Satan exists proves that God gave freedom to every single creature he's ever created. And that he's not this God that does wickedness or evil to anyone because even Satan is using the power that he was given by God for evil today. And God is not taking it away. He's not, he's not you know, but eventually he's going to be, of course, he's, he's not going to be, uh, he's not going to exist for eternity. But, but God is... Dealing with that right now because, you know, he has to let this, everything mature, right? Everything has to ripen, right? Everybody has to realize and recognize the grossness of sin and the results of it. But God gave all of these men freedom to choose spiritual uh, blindness, just like he grants to all men the same today. It is not God that hardens hearts. It is we that harden our own hearts by choosing our own way. And notice that when the heart becomes hard, it cannot have spiritual understanding. Notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 as we start to wind down. Notice. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Who's blinding his heart? His own self. Notice. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Notice here it says the natural man. The natural man here describes every son of Adam. Every person was born with a carnal mind. That means all of us are actually born already hardened. We're already bent towards sin. We are already not subject to God or His ways at all. That's how we're born. So we are born disabled. And then God comes in and says, here, I'm ready to make you free. Are you ready? And we come to that crossroad. In Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, it says, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Everyone was born with this condition. No one can escape it. Deuteronomy 29, verses 1 through 4, says, These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he had made with them in Horeb. And Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen, notice there, ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh and unto all his servants and unto all his land. The great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive or eyes to see or ears to hear unto this day. It doesn't mean that they didn't have the freedom to do that. It means that they had not received what God was trying to give them. 
If there were any group of people on the face of this planet that had ever seen the wondrous miracles of God more than anyone else, it had to be the Israelites. But the problem was that most of them were disabled and could not benefit from it. They, 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 it's not that they, most of them were disabled. I want to clarify that. All of them were born disabled, but many of them chose to remain disabled. That's more accurate. The majority of them chose to remain disabled. And that's why they could not benefit from all of the things, all of the miracles that God was expressing and showing to unto them. They did not, eventually they, none of them except two entered into the promised land. Right? Caleb and Joshua were the only two that received healing from the Lord. And so we're going to close with a few thoughts here. We're going to go to Ezekiel 36, 26. This is God's desire for every soul on the planet. And it doesn't leave out anyone. Remember, God is not a respecter of persons. In Ezekiel chapter 36, 26, he says, A new heart will I give you. Is that a promise? It, does that apply to just some people? No. It applies to everyone. Showing that God is not hardening any hearts or closing any ears or closing any eyes. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. But how do we receive all these things? By allowing him to do it. Right? We have to allow him. Look at 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So, our closing quotation. I believe it's James chapter 1, verses 19 to 25. Let us close with this. This is an admonition to each and every one of us within the hearing of my voice. And God speaks to us and this is what he says. Wherefore, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Notice the contrast. Swift, that means fast. Fast to hear, slow to speak. Because normally, we're the opposite, right? We're quick to speak <laughs> and slow to hear. Right? But God is saying, no, 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 I, I, need you, I need you to listen to this counsel I want to give you. And by my spirit, you'll be able to, to, to become this way. You will be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filth filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness and engrafted and with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. In other words, past tense. God wants us to remember what we were, but move forward in what He wants to make us. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Did you get that? Amen? Is that clear? Praise the Lord. So brethren, let us be encouraged as we go forward, even with today's activities, as we remember that today is a beautiful day where God is raining down on us. His Spirit is the day where we have drawn closer to Him because every distraction 
has been moved away, therefore it is said that he is drawing closer to us. And so let us take advantage of that beautiful, beautiful occasion today, the beautiful hours of the Sabbath, and let us receive everything that God has in store for us. Amen? Let us pray. Dear loving Father, we want to thank you so much for speaking to our hearts. And we thank you for showing us, Lord, that you have given every good and perfect gift to every soul and the only way we will benefit is if we open our hearts completely, which is opening the door completely, to allow you to come in and stop with us. So dear Father, take charge of our hearts and our minds. We pray, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. We pray, Lord, that we will be able to the be able to develop the sweetness of yours as we behold it in you. Help us to fix our eyes upon you in such a way that it will change and transform us. Help us not to place any trust in self. Help us to see our grossness before coming to you. And even within ourselves, we are still, that would be, that's our condition. The self is gross. But help us to recognize that you have given us a promise that if we allow you to, you would come in and you would make us sweet and you would, give, you would save us. You will rescue us from our disabled conditions. And so dear God, we thank you for that beautiful promise. And help us all to grab, grab a hold of that promise with all of our mind. So that you can be glorified through us. And bless us as we continue on with today's program. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.